Okay, so we are officially live for building bridges between academia and industry uh, here at Texas Biomed. My name is Dr. Tracy Boss. I am here at Texas Biomed as a managers in innovation. Uh, and also the reason why I guess I'm leading this is with building bridges between academia and industry. I've had a lot of experience uh, previously with Nature Publishing Group where I interviewed a lot of different scientists in industry and also academics. And then I also worked at University of Rochester on something called broadening experiences and scientific training. So I know that there are a few uh, Rochester folks out there, welcome to you. Um, but the idea of uh, building bridges to, between academia and industry, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to start talking to folks in industry in order to kind of figure out what industry is like and also to make your way through that doorway and see if it's a path for you. So something that I used to use a lot uh, in my uh, past experiences, even, even now, if you want me to help you, uh, I'm, I'm open to that. But this is basically a structure for an informational interview. So what you're seeing today with this panelist uh, in front of you, we're gonna be doing uh, collecting information, the informational interview. It's not about getting a job, it's just about getting information. And so what you'll see is kind of a template for that. And even though we've done it for you, you can do this yourself at any time because we are we have all as you see us we have been in your shoes before we have uh, received our phds probably done a postdoc somewhere done a lot of jobs to get to where we are so we all want you to succeed and amazingly i want you to remember this there are people out here that want to help you so that's why the panel is here uh, and i'm going to go ahead and start by stopping talking and i'm going to call on names i've got a list here of who is is uh, with us on the panel and i'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell a little bit about uh, their work but i'm going to give them five minutes each so i'm going to start with the top person on my list who is Preeti. thanks tracy i'm really glad to be here and you might hear other voices here because that's that those are the perks of working from home, especially when you've got dogs that want to be in the meeting too. <laughs> so uh, currently I am a medical science liaison with Moderna and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, been an infectious disease person all my life and got a master's, um, actually two masters because I was indecisive of what I was gonna do. And then went ahead and did a PhD from North Dakota State University and ended up doing postdocs, wanting to go the usual academia route um, till I realized that maybe I could apply my knowledge um, and live my passion and do what I do best, talk about science, learn more science, dissipate more science and still, you know, be earning something. So, <laughs> so that's where um, I started applying and I looked at a job um, that, you know, I had not heard about a medical science liaison, what do they do? And, you know, it was, it was not clear to me. So I found out a little bit more and applied for my first job at Sanofi. And um, believe me, we start off by thinking that we, we can do it, but academia actually trains you for every kind of job. So, um, fit right in, enjoyed my uh, stint there. Um, still being trained as an acad and, you know, from academia I had this urge to learn more, do something more. So I applied training now to train the MSL team and also, you know, be a medical science liaison. And we'll talk about that uh, slowly. So that's my introduction in uh, short. I like to say I wandered quite a bit, but I'm in the right place right now. <laughs> so exactly. Um, then the next person on my list is Leo. Oh, this is fun because I wandered quite a bit too, pretty. So, <laughs> so I was actually uh, an MD PhD student. Um, thought that I was going to do neurosurgery and be both a surgeon and a researcher. Um, actually, did a neurosurgical rotation and went okay. I like the operating room, but I, I actually want my patients to have a better life expectancy after I'm done with them. Um, so after I finished the program, I went on and did a general surgery residency. I was very wrapped up in it. I love my patients. I did a trauma fellowship running around with like multiple pagers at a level one center, helicopter coming in with patients. It was very dramatic. <laughs> and I love the patients. But in stepping back and looking at where 
surgery was going as a field, it just wasn't really aligning with what I wanted. Um, the degree of autonomy that I thought I was going to have, the red tape, the paperwork, the rising cost of insurance, and the lowering degree of reimbursement. It was like, this is not a place where I think I can make a career long term and still be a sane, happy, adjusted individual at the end of the day. So I stepped away from that, thought about, you know, I do have this PhD, um, started reconnecting with friends of mine who had I gone to graduate school with or met during the course of my grad school um, life. And the very last person that I met with who I thought was doing a postdoc at Columbia said, oh no, I, I'm not doing the postdoc thing anymore. I'm like, well, what are you doing? She's like, I'm, I'm a medical writer. I, I'm in medical communications. And I went, what is that? <laughs> and she sat me down, talked to me about it, said, send me your CV. Um, let's see if we can get you started in the field. And so that's how I stumbled into the wonderful world of medical communications. I've been here for over a decade. Um, initially, I kind of did everything. You, when you're coming in with an MD, um, and you're coming in with a, a sort of a very primary care background, like I had as a surgeon, um, I got thrown into every therapeutic area on the block, which was great. I never said no. And I, that was the one thing I would, piece of advice I would give you is don't say no. Even if you have no idea how you're going to do it, try it. You might find that it's wonderful and you like it. Um, and then as I started to really think about where do I want to be long-term, I really was looking for oncology work. So I have been exclusively on oncology for the past four years or so. Um, at the last two of those have been at Banium working for the super awesome Rich Belzer, who's gonna talk about himself uh, later. Um, and yeah, that was how I got here. It was a very sort of circuitous path. I fell into a lot of things. Um, and again, I would say, don't say no, be open to falling into things because that's how I'd say the majority of us have found what we what we truly like to do. Sounds good. And I see a lot of head nodding. So yeah. Uh, the next person on my list is the, as I think she mentioned, the excellent Richard. So uh, he will tell a little bit about himself. The, the, the buildup might be a little, you know, might be a letdown after the buildup. Um, so to, I, I was less of a, a wanderer. So I, I've been, uh, let's see. So from a, a young age, I liked science. Uh, I think it was my high school biology teacher that that really turned me on to to science. Um, and then from there, went to college. I said, okay, well, I like the molecular side. Then after that, went to the PhD route in in Rutgers, uh, doing molecular biology. And then towards the end, uh, started thinking, well, this didn't feel like like me. Um, I liked the science. I liked the the critical thinking, but I just felt like I had um, you know, other strengths that I could offer that may not be leveraged on the bench. Uh, and, and that combined with maybe a less than amazing publication record that could uh, decrease my, my chances once we get to the, to the postdoc route uh, was really leading me to start to explore other options. And uh, like Leo kind of fell into medical communications, medical writing, um, I had a, a friend, I guess we all have that friend, that gateway friend to, to some of these careers um who who had done the postdoc route had um you know left postdoc and started working in, in medical writing and then i had i was at that point where i was like well do we do postdoc or do we do um you know this other route and he came along and i went i never even did the postdoc i went straight into to medical communications and i've been doing it now for uh 15 years the last seven at at vanium group um, i think the when, when I look back about um, grad school and, and some of the decisions, I think the, the most important part is when you're in the lab or you're, you're getting your, your, your PhD, you're really learning how to think critically. And that's a skill that can be applied anywhere. Um, it's not only applicable on the bench. And so you're learning how to learn essentially and how to apply that knowledge. And so, you know, from, from my perspective, you, there's nothing you can't do after you've, after you've done that. So I think, you know, along the same lines as, as Leo, as far as being open, I always think, you know, be curious, um, ask lots of questions. And then another thing that I've noticed um, about 15 years into this is that, you know, I, I had maybe done this when I was saying academia or, or that those decisions 
aren't necessarily as exclusive as they used to be from my perspective. I think that there's a lot of, and you, you might hear from other panelists here, um, there's a lot of mobility across different industries um, in, in, in science. And so, you know, it is an important decision, maybe towards the end of your, your, your PhD or your, your, your research, um, but it's not the only one you're going to make. So I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a point that, that I wanted to, to also share. So thanks. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, next person on my list is Louis. Okay, I was I was muted. Uh, thank you, Tracy. And I also want to thank uh, Smita Kulkarni who reached out to me for this. Uh, I'm going to go a little different from the previous three uh, speakers. I will go from where I'm currently and uh, all the way back. So right now I'm uh, the CSO of a French uh, startup biotech company called Imchek Therapeutics. Uh, this uh, is very exciting to me because what we are doing essentially as a startup is uh, doing cool science, uh, but also trying to raise a lot of money. Uh, we are trying to raise money for uh, for the, uh, my researchers to do their excellent work and also trying to balance the investment thesis that our investors have and what we are trying to do at the end of the day. I think at the end of the day, for me, the calling card is uh, that we need to make transformative medicine for patients who are, uh, uh, you know, dealing with these uh, um, horrible diseases. Uh, and these diseases not just affect the patients, but they affect everybody surrounding them. So when we are treating a patient, we are not just treating the patient itself uh, or himself or herself, but the whole family. So there is a whole community that benefits from every treatment that we provide to. So this is a fantastic time in my life where I'm able to do a lot of good stuff and also learn the business angle of what happens in the biotech world. Uh, I've been here in uh, Marseille, south of France for, for the last one year. We are enjoying Marseille, we are enjoying south of France, going around, enjoying the rosé and the French life, which is fantastic. Uh, but before that, I was in uh, in US. I'm a, a US citizen. I've been in US for the last 25 years. Uh, I, uh, I was always in big pharma, uh, companies like uh, Nectar Therapeutics, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Takeda, uh, Celgene, which is now part of BMS. So uh, I call these big pharmaceutical companies as the university of uh, training where they invest in you, they put money in you, they, they're the leaders, they, uh, they train you to do these things. So I really encourage all, all of you if you get a chance to go and learn something, uh, whatever it might be your calling later on, but if you go to a, one of those big pharma companies, they, uh, as you put your time in there, they also put a lot of resource, money and training to you guys, so, which is very important. Uh, I did my postdoc uh, at La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology. So I'm essentially a immunologist. And my, my the central thesis is that I look at all problems through the lens of an immunologist. Uh, even a simple human solution, I think of it as, how would an immunologist try to solve it? And this is very important because any disease that we look at it, the first thing we do is uh, you know draw out a blood uh, from your veins and either look at blood plasma levels, blood cell type, is your neutrophil high, is your hemoglobin high, is your uh, blood chemistry, and everything is immunology for me. I'm, I'm that way, trained that way. So that, that's my calling card, uh, and I apply immunology to solve medical problems. Uh, I uh, Before coming to uh, the States, I did my PhD in uh, University of Mumbai uh, back in India. Uh, I, uh, that's where I met uh, Smita, for sure. She came in as a summer student initially and eventually she became a PhD student there. And uh, it, it was, it's fantastic, uh, great memories there. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, that was also an important uh, learning for me, uh, studying uh, under the tutelage of uh, some of the very bright uh, professors in, in India, 
to learn immunology and applied immunology. Um, uh, as you can see, I'm in, uh, I'm in India, even though officially um, I'm a US citizen, but uh, I'm in Indian. I'm, I'm from south of India, which called a state called Kerala, which is uh, probably one of the most beautiful states in the whole, whole of the world. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's me. Thank you for your nutshell. Very good uh, summary, and we'll be hearing more from you when we open the questions and answers. So uh, last but not least on my list is uh, Seski. All right, great, thanks. I am sorry to say that I'm not in a beautiful place outside of France, you know, to be uh, talking to you all today. It's just, as I was saying earlier today to the presenters, gloomy DC, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> so my name is Seski Ramon. Um, um, I currently work at AstraZeneca. I am a strategy and portfolio um, director. So what that means is I lead the strategy for the immune oncology franchise. Um, it's a little bit of a different hat to what I've heard a lot of the folks here. We have a very diverse panel, I think. Um, I primarily focus my um, every day on looking at business strategies to maximize the portfolio for um, the immune oncology franchise at AstraZeneca. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about what that actually entails throughout the conversation. Um, but a little bit of how I got here. I've been in DC for about six years and in this time I've had quite a number of hats. I think. Uh, a bit of a different path to a lot of folks. Um, so I did my traditional training, PhD in immunology. So Lou, I'm right there with you on that. Uh, got uh, my postdoc. I did a two-year postdoc. I knew early on that I did not want to be an academic. I had that very clear. I just didn't know what the other option was going to be. Um, and I think that was that, looking back, I think that was fine, that I was being very truthful to myself. Um, and so what I decided to do is I applied to a fellowship. It's called the AAAS Fellowship. Um, and what they are focused on is to bring, is the Science Policy Fellowship. They bring PhDs and postdocs into DC and you get placed throughout different agencies, uh, whether it's in Congress, for the Senate, for the House, or the different um, uh, executive branches, so NIH, uh, uh, NSF, et cetera. And so I landed at the NIH. I worked for Francis Collins under his office. Um, this was um, around the time, well, I was there for about two years. Um, and so I got to do a lot of things. You work on, on policies, so li literally writing federal policy for clinical trials, for um, how to look at data. Um, got to work on the cancer moonshot that Biden launched at that time as a VP. Um, got to go bowling at the White House. So thank you for staying up late every, every other day. Um, and then uh, there was an election that was had on for, uh, you know, unexpected outcomes. And so uh, DC shifted. Uh, I decided that was a good time for me to leave government and go into the private sector, which I did. And I lobbied for uh, the pharmaceutical industry for a number of years after that. Uh, so this is part of the DC ecosystem that, you know, things move along with the uh, political calendar, I would say. Um, so I moved um, to the private sector, uh, worked for Bio, which is the largest biotech and biopharma trade association. Uh, in the world, and I think it was Leo who said this, um, that it was a very interesting time because I pretty much started, they knew I was a scientist, they knew I was an immunologist, but to them, I was a PhD, so let me throw you all these questions and all these things that you can probably answer when it comes down to science questions on, in Congress, um, and I just kept saying yes to everything. I uh, just, you know, don't know how to do it. Give me a second. I'll figure it out. I'll come back to you with an answer, uh, so I'm, I'm sure that would be uh, a, a theme for today, but um, so I did that for a number of years and then an opportunity came through, one of those inflection points, uh, something I realized in my career where I could either choose to stay in DC and become a, that, that ultimate, uh, you know, DC insider track that many people take um, or um, go back a little more to the science pharma industry that where I wanted to be. Uh, an opportunity came along that helped me do that. And so I decided to kind of um, lean less so on the DC politics and go more so towards the pharma, right? Because I was in the middle of those two. And that's how I ended up at AstraZeneca for a number of years. Um, kind of doing a little bit, bringing a lot of the skills from my policy and advocacy world times to now industry in the more um, business strategy. So 
a little bit of a different path, but I think that's probably the, 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 the trend um, with all the panelists here today. Thank you very much. And yeah, the trend of a lot of wandering paths. And I, I, one of the quotes is all who wander are not lost. So obviously you have all ended up in the right spot and this may not be your, your final spot. There's always changes along the way. Um, and so we've finished with introductions. And what I'm gonna do now is uh, for people in the audience, you may type in, if you can see it, the Q and A box. And I will, uh, give your questions to the panelists here so that they may answer anything you would wonder about. And I was gonna say, as you're figuring out how to do the Q&A, and if you can't figure that out, there's also a chat you can do either way, I can monitor either. Uh, but as we start out, uh, I guess I'm gonna ask a question to get people warmed up. The idea that people have been saying opportunities came along. And one thing about people in the audience, I, I think they always wonder, well, what if I'm not that lucky? You know, maybe this was a lot of luck. They got opportunities. So I'm going to ask the panelists and, and people can answer as they wish the idea of how do you make your own opportunities? Yes, you get a lot of luck, but can you give some advice on how to make opportunities for people that aren't sure? Are we, are we using the right hands? I'll use the right hand. Go for All it. Habits now in Zoom yep. time. Yep. But I'm gonna jump in here because this this actually hits a very DC, uh, um, a very DC centric approach. And I was told this early on when I arrived to DC. I was told you need to be having. You always meet people for coffee, right? That's that's the the usual. Well, pre pandemic, of course. Hopefully we we'll get there again. Uh, but we have to meet people for coffee uh as the excuse to just have this information interviews and then that being the gateway to a, a bigger conversation and i was told you need to be having so many internet information interviews that your teeth will turn black from all the coffee you're drinking and it's that simple um <laughs> and, and that what that translated is you don't really know which one of this conversation is going to be the most valuable or the most interesting or the one that is going to lead to the next discussion or the next step you can't plan for that. So you need to have as many as you can and you'll connect with people and you'll find that everybody's open to have that conversation. But it is really just getting yourself out there and having this discussion. So once your teeth turn black. Yep, and I see Preeti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there's, there's the other thing that, yes, of course, I, I really love that networking is very, very important, keeping an open mind. But also what is equally important is making a note of everything you do, every single thing that you've done in your um, career as an, in academia. So when you look at a job posting, sometimes when you just look at it, you are like, ah, I've not done this, but guess what you have? Um, it's just in a different way. Um, and it's all about polishing your CV a little bit. You know, you, maybe you're part of a training and that, that can be called as an adult training or something like that. So keeping a note of what you're doing, never undermining what you've done um, and never underselling because <laughs> that's the number one thing that um, you know, we do. We look at our gels and we are like, oh, it's not good. Let's run 10 more and put them in the paper. Oh, this is not good enough, but it is. <laughs> so that's, that's the number one thing that I would like to say, network and never, never undermine your um, you know, achievements. And Louis, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe I'm saying the same, the, the sentiments are the same, but I'm saying it in a different way. Uh, I do think that, you know, when we started, at least when I started, uh, when there was not this kind of a boom of net availability of, uh, you know, you know, internet and, uh, you know, you could do a video call or video chat. I remember when I got my postdoc uh, in, in Lahore Institute, uh, I would say that as much as you said that luck is, doesn't play, we should not rely on luck. Luck was a big part. I, my my postdoc mentor, who is no more uh, alive with us, was visiting New Delhi and I was in a conference in New Delhi. And I think like uh, as Preeti and uh, uh, others have said I was just rel relentless. I was going to every professor available and talking to them and telling them, hey, uh, I, I'm finishing my PhD. I would love to do this. I would love to do that. I dragged along my PhD mentor, Dr. Chitlankar, along with me uh, as, a, as a source of support. 
uh, and we would go and talk to people uh, and just have coffee or you know just sit around and talk to them if they come out of a, uh, one of their presentations i would just go to them with uh, a few questions hey this is, i i really enjoyed your presentation i had some questions can i ask and you know how it is uh, you know, my boss at least uh, eli sattas who was uh, at that time the dean of ucla uh, would be surrounded by hundreds of people jostling trying to get a, a little time a face time with that guy and uh, you know uh, and then you know then it is what how do you make out of it whatever you get if it if, if whatever little opportunity you get how do you maximize uh, that's also an important piece of it but i would say that uh, i think uh, at least in my case uh, luck was a big part of everything that happened and uh, uh, and i think leo i think you mentioned that take any opportunity that you get just make the best out of it that's very important as well uh, yep yep and i see rich's hand raised and i'm also as you transition i see a question about can you tell people what medical communications is so maybe you can blend the two oh, i'll do both yeah um, so I think, yeah, and I, I like um, what Seth, said about you know, talking to people and, 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 and your teeth, teeth turning black. I think what's cool is when you, you do those information interviews, the big portion of it is, yes, you're, you're learning. There's a pull there, but I think you're also getting the opportunity to talk about yourself over and over again and get comfortable with that story. Um, and I think sometimes it sounds differently when you say it out loud to someone else. Um, you know, I think I, I you know, when when you're having new ideas or things like that, it's always good to keep you know talking about them to more and more people. Same idea here. It's only you're the idea, right? So I think you know having those opportunities to to have those conversations really can help you figure out you know what sounds good when you say it. Um, so you get more comfortable talking to people too. And then the other part of that too is I think you know understanding your strengths, even if you're early in your career. Well, where where does your mind go when you're not busy? What are you thinking about? Like you know, because that's, you know, people say follow your passion, which can sometimes be difficult because what if you're like, well, you know, like you said, I'm running gels. I'm not passionate about this. Um, but there are times when it's quiet, but you still think that's to me sometimes gives you that sort of kernel of what your passion might be because, you know, where does your mind go during those times? Now, to the other question, uh, medical communication. So uh, what we do um, primarily from the scientific side, uh, which is typically one of the, the easiest you know, gateways into, into, for a PhD into this, this career is we help uh, our clients, which are biotech and pharma, um, communicate their data, right? So from a very basic standpoint, um, you know, we've been to Congresses, we've seen New England Journal papers, things like that. Uh, medical writers work with the pharma companies, and then in, in the case of you know, clinical trials, the, the folks who, who ran the clinical trial to uh, put together the data, package data in a way that the audience can really you know, understand what happened in that trial and what does this mean for, for you know, medicine moving forward. Uh, that's one very basic and kind of obvious way that, that medical communications uh, works. Um, but all along the way, you know, whether it's helping with um, you know, clinical trial enrollment, whether it's, um, you know, getting together the top doctors in the field and asking them about, you know, what are the opportunities for treatment here? What are the, what are the unmet needs? Like, so there's, there's just so many ways that, um, you know, someone from science can get involved in, in medical communications. And so what I like to think of it from a very basic standpoint is we help the super brilliant people that are doing all these things spend as much time as possible doing that and less time doing some of these these other things that we're actually very good at so it's, it's a really fun partnership hopefully that helped answer the question i think it did and just in case uh leo do you have anything to add with your experience with the communication yeah i always describe it as we are we are pharma adjacent <laughs> So we don't work, we're not directly part of a pharmaceutical company, but we help them do all of those things that Rich described just to get the work done. Um, because if you had to be the person who ran the clinical trial and compiled all the data and did all the analysis 
and wrote the and wrote the abstract for submission to you know the major congress to present it and wrote the you would have to have you know either a, a, a time warp or um you know multiple clones of yourself to get all that work done so we help to take things off the plates of the people who are working at the pharmaceutical company so that everything gets done in a very orchestrated seamless way but they don't have to do everything yes that sounds perfect uh, I'm also going to piggyback off what Rich had said about when you're going through informational interviews, you are the idea that you're discussing. Another thing people can think of is you're all working on projects. Sometimes you have to make time that you are the project. How are you going to develop yourself in order to get to the next career? So one of the questions that I see in the in the chat or the, the Q&A is, um, what are some of the challenges you face when transferring from academia to industry without any prior experience in industry. So I think summing it up is how do you work on yourself while you're in academia to make yourself uh, attractive to the next kind of niche you're going to go to? Any advice on the training they can do while they're training? So I see Suski, yes. Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to answer this in two parts. So, so one, a very concrete one, right? Like the, the, what can you do to um, add that additional training? Um, in the path that I took, which was moving to policy and government, some of the things that help differentiate individuals was those who had taken any sort of activities or responsibilities outside the lab. And so if you're going in to compete against any, any position where you, your competition is all the people doing also PhDs or coming up with postdocs, everybody's going to have very similar lab experiences. Forget about the techniques, right? Like that's, that's going to become kind of irrelevant, if I'm being fully honest. It, it's going to be like you're going to have an experience in problem solving, critical thinking, right? That's very similar. So what else do you have that differentiates you? Right? Are you engaged in any sort of additional extracurricular uh, activities from that lab life? So um, are you able to engage in any sort of um, publication within your institution? Are you engaged in it? In my case, I um, started being part of a policy uh, group that we had, and then I did kind of a, um, a leadership um, policy team from, from a distance with the immunology uh, professional society. And so it's, it's small things. They don't have to be super time consuming, but it's small things to differentiate yourself from a lot of the other um, peers that, you, that, that you're applying with, right? And so think through what additional skills you can have, right? If you can um, put in some time to do some editing, to do some reviewing, you know, those additional opportunities will be very helpful. The other piece that be, before I, I turn over, the, the second part of that, that I think is very important is, I found that, um, you know, PhD postdoc scientists are really, really skilled technical, a technical uh, aspects, but really bad at translating and selling themselves in a different context. And I'm being fully transparent, right? Like, like I was really bad at that. It, it, you know, you go out there, you say, well, you know, I really don't really know a lot about things. I know about, you know, I, I know uh, flow cytometry and, and how to do ELISAs, but that's not really going to translate to a business position. You're absolutely right. It won't. But it turns out they actually have a bunch of other skills that you are not used to telling people that you have, right? critical thinking, you know how to do scientific writing, you know how to translate that into a high level for the communications business, right? If you know how to summarize complex data into simple terms, you know how to um, write grants and secure funding. So you know how to uh, communicate a complex problem into a business decision, right? There are pieces in your training that if you know how to look at it from a different lens, it will make you very marketable, right? If you are able to lead or train any groups in the lab where you, you know, had to uh, mentor students, uh, teach students, train students, or um, lab managers. You now have people, you know, some basic element of people experience, right? Those are things that are important, and translatable that we just don't often think about it that way. Uh, that, you know, it it took me more than a second to understand that and then be able to how to put it into a CV properly. And then I see Preeti. You know, I'm, I'm going to, if I had a million hearts, I would give that to the previous comment. It's, it's all about kind of, you know, you've got those skill sets, you have a product, but you need to market it really, really well. So knowing 
who to reach out and how to reach out. And one of the biggest issues that I faced was every single application, you have to change your CV or resume a little bit. You have to highlight different things. It's not one size fits all. And you have to use the words that are there in the applications because otherwise you get a feeling of a machine denied you the next day. So you get, oh, I'm sorry, you're not fit for this. So you have to work on your CV and, and, and that's, that's the marketing part. So you have to let people know what you're good at. And then the other part is who is your audience? Find out who the hiring manager is from LinkedIn or you know who, who's in the company. Can you reach them out? Um, can you say, hey, can, can I talk to you over Zoom? It's easy. And, and believe me, um, it is not as daunting as it sounds. People respond back. Uh, they are not reviewers of your publication that they would not want to talk to you or you shouldn't reach them out. And it works. It, it helps because now you have the right words on your CV and you've contacted the right person. Maybe they are not making a decision, but they can tell you who's making the decision and reach out. So very, very important. And I see Leo. Tracy has a guest. <laughs> I, <like laughs> <your> guest Tracy. <laughs> I was also going to say, if you, especially I saw that question about, you know, if you're a third year PhD student, what can you do now? Um, if you know that, okay, I don't necessarily want to be at the bench, there are a number of professional societies that you can either join for the reduced student fee, and a lot of them have great reduced student fees, um, or you can literally lurk and just follow them on LinkedIn. Um, I always tell people, if you're interested in medical writing, the American Medical Writer Association is phenomenal. They provide a lot of really wonderful training content. They do webinars. They will teach you about all the different kinds of medical writing. And in the process of that, they also have a really well-established network. Um, Rich and I run a training program to develop medical writers. And we look for you know grads from PhDs, PharmDs, MDs. And one of the things that always impresses me, and I can always tell when I have a candidate um, who has been part, who has joined the American Medical Writers Association, who has taken some of their writing seminars, because they will teach you skills that for free or for some small reduced membership fee that will help you then to transfer. A lot of them will also have like certification programs because you know it's great that you have a degree in molecular biology or immunology, but it was as was said earlier, a lot of folks will have a degree in molecular biology or immunology. So if you can say, well, yes, but I also, I did this training, I participated in this program, um, it's great. It will boost your resume. It will also boost your thinking. So it's it's great for your branding. It's great to expand your personal experience um, and help you sort of get a sneak peek into what you're signing up for from a career perspective. And similar kinds of organizations, if you're interested in being in an MSL, I'd say join MAPS, don't even think about it. Um, and get that information um, and also get the, that exposure to the networks that are inherent in those groups as well. So just like you would join a society in the field, in your field of study, do the same thing um, from a professional standpoint, for sure. And now I see Louis. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, as Jessica or uh, Leo mentioned, you know, if you guys can differentiate yourself, people who, you know, don't want to take a traditional path, uh, you know, that's, that's an amazing way to differentiate yourself, find something that is, that is um, not the traditional path of an immunologist or a molecular biologist or, you know, things for cell biologist. But let me tell you my story, because I did the traditional path. I was a lab rat in postdoc. I, I was a lab rat initially in all my career during in the pharma. We need lab rats, I'll tell you. We need a lot of uh, people who are very good at pipetting, doing experiments, creating data. We need that. I think uh, at the end of the day, at least uh, the way I think about uh, pharma R&D is that uh, if you can't generate uh, solid, good data, everything else falls, falls apart. So we need very good trained scientists who are diligent in their experiments, do small improvements on the knowledge, build on others' knowledge to create new set of uh, uh, 
uh, the pathways and mechanisms and molecules or monoclonals and stuff like that, uh, we need them. I don't think there is uh, that uh, every every postdoc that comes out in a year, uh, the, uh, the farmer still needs people. I think there is a there is a kind of uh, especially with the biotech boom that's happening, you know, in the Silicon Valley, in uh, uh, in Boston. Uh, in in now happening in New York, happening in uh, in uh, in Texas, in uh, everywhere. I think uh, there is a big requirement for scientists, good scientists, decent scientists who can do a good a good set of experiments. Because you know this is where the biotech boom is happening, creating new set of molecules, new pathways, discovering things. And so I I would still say that you know that's that's still an open avenue you don't get disheartened that you don't have a big paper or several papers and don't worry about it keep at it because there is still a high demand for good scientists and you know in biotech world now with investors putting money into it it's a decently paying job as well and finally what i would say to everyone is that this is a cliche term called uh, fake it till you make it uh, you know, continue doing that. I think you have to. You have to do that. You know, you. Are, I think this is uh, something that you have to. If you get an opportunity, grab it by the horn and you know, uh, get on, get on with it. Yeah, the idea of fake it till you make it, or like Suski had said, uh, give me a second and I'll get back to you. I'm sure I can figure it out. Uh, so I'm going to change the conversation a little bit based on what you were talking about with uh, lab, lab rats and the idea of working at the bench. I know a number of trainees, graduate students, they ask, do I really need to do a postdoc for some of these careers? Because they're, they're interested in skipping that. And then in the chat, I also see the idea of how beneficial is it to do an MBA or take a business certificate program alongside a PhD? So do you need these types of technical trainings to be attractive to these other uh, non-academic careers? Yep, I have I I have a very specific mindset on this one, and I'm sure we might have different views on this. But my take on this is, unless you want to do an academic track, you don't need a postdoc, and an MBA is also not needed. And we can discuss the merits of that one. But you now have a terminal degree, a very long <laughs> degree, took you many many years. Leverage that as hard as you can. The start might be a little bit slow. You might have your first job might not be the most ideal one. That's fine. You probably still gonna make more money than a postdoc, just for the record. And you then be set up for a pretty good next step after that, right? If you're thinking about postdoc, it's gonna be a minimum of two years, right? You could get a job in an industry that you might be thinking about or try to something that is not academic. It won't be, you know, it, it might not be your dream job, but you must still get way more skills that you can translate to that next step. Right, but it's a slower, it's a slower trajectory, um, and it's certainly not as linear as one and as clear as the one that we have in academia. Right, in academia, you know, you're a postdoc, you're a professor, professor, then you're blah blah blah. The other path is a lot of unknowns, and that's fine. You got to get a little more comfortable with that. But um, that's my very strong, strong, strong stand on that one. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. I think it is good to hear. And then uh, Preeti has raised her hand. Oh, and you are on mute. Yeah, you need to. There we go. <laughs> um, a little bit of different approach. I mean, having said that, you don't you don't actually need a postdoc. Um, don't be averse to doing one. I mean, if if that's what you're getting, do it. Because what I found that the kind of skill sets I gained during my postdoc were the ones that I could leverage and highlight. Um, as PhD students, I wanted to go on, you know into the medical science liaison, the training. Um, kind of platform. So I got to train students, I got to write grants, projects and stuff like that, which sometimes you don't get as a PhD student, if you've got it's good enough. So take every single day at a time, do what is best at that time. And the, I, the most important thing for me was to focus on what I want at the end, and then kind of get all my um, you know, my game together. So this is what I want to do. I want to be training and I want to be doing this. And uh, that kind of helped. And with the MBA question too, if you if you are aiming at a job that um, having a business management is going to put you at the cutting edge, 
do that. Um, it's like, don't stop. I mean, <laughs> sometimes that's, that's, that's basically, and I liked what, ne uh, you know, Leo said in the beginning, don't say no to anything right now, because um, you've got to be sponges in the beginning, just take, take in everything and, and then decide what's best. Very good advice. And I see Rich. Yeah, I, I appreciate Seski for taking the, the the direct and potentially controversial answer, but it, but I actually I 100% agree with him because I, I didn't I didn't do a postdoc, um, and and uh, I, I I think to 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 marry the two what Pre what Preeti had said too is, you know I don't think of these things as necessarily requirements to move forward, right? They they can't hurt, but they but I wouldn't. You know, because I'm trying to think back to, to, you know, PhD times are great. I got PhD. Now I got to get this. Then I'll do that. Not necessarily. You don't, you know, don't think of those things as, as barriers. If it's open and it's something you're interested in and it works. And like, like Preeti said, don't, you know, and Leo, don't say, don't say no, but don't add that as a barrier potentially to moving forward. And I think, you know, when we think about, you know, postdoc or not, or, or, or what your next step is. And I like what Teske said about the, the trajectory and, and things like that. For me, as long as the next step opened more doors down the line, then it isn't a bad idea. And again, as this, you know, as these different industries get together, or, or you know, there's the lines between them are are not nearly as as thick as they used to be. So you know, as long as you're opening more doors, it can't hurt. So that way, you're not really focused on that one decision. Absolutely. And so I'm going to change the conversation a bit to kind of blend some of these questions together. The idea of, uh, you've already mentioned when you look at a list that's in a job, oh, I don't have those things, where most of the time you do, it's just speaking about it in a different way. Or that's the dream candidate. Maybe that candidate doesn't exist. Maybe you have enough of those qualifications that you are actually the dream candidate. So the questions that I'm going to blend are, uh, somebody asks, how do you face failure about not getting interviews or having trouble finding a job, and we've all been there. So the idea of how do you handle this failure as you're trying to move to your next spot? And then also uh, the stability of these types of jobs. If you're aiming for these things, is this something that you have to, how do you think about that stability versus uh, in these jobs compared to academia? Because maybe academia is considered more stable, but then for people with funding, maybe it's not. So I'm gonna ask, uh, how do you handle failure? And then also, what do you think about in terms of stability when you're looking for your career? Okay, I can, I can uh, talk about uh, how do you handle failure. You know, again, this is getting back to some cliche. I, I tell this to everyone, life is like a battery. It has a positive and a negative. And for a battery to efficiently work, you need both ends of it. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you know, you, when you have positives, you utilize what all you learned in the positives and be aware that you know that that is just be, don't don't gloat yourself too much in the positives on the contrary when it is negative uh, there are lessons learned during the negatives and you know it's a full circle life is a full circle so whenever you have negatives actually what i have seen is that i learned more in my life during the phases when i had a negative or a downward motion uh, because i do introspect I, I look at, okay, why was this outcome not favorable to me? I will talk to experts, I'll talk to my, my mentors and uh, ask them, hey, what was it that I could have done better for the next time? Uh, so having a kind of a network or a set of people whom you can confide in your challenges that you have faced and get some input from them, that would help. And uh, think of it that these negative uh, situations or downward situations don't last forever. In the big picture of things, you know, these pass away, and you're, you know, it's it's very cyclical. Uh, uh, but having said that, I, I would tell you when I was applying for my first set of pharma jobs, it took me forever. It took me forever, and I was I was like, as I'm sure many of you guys, you know, feeling pretty pretty down on myself, and you know, but then uh, it happened. Uh, and you would, you know, people just forget when things positively happen, they just completely forget about what uh, did not happen to your life and then you move on. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that's how I see it. I think that positives and negatives are part of the life. Learn from your negatives. Uh, don't glow too much on your positives. 
and things will happen. I think you have to be at it. You have to pay more attention when things are not going well, a little more introspection, maybe use your team and your team, include your family members, uh, you know, use your family, use your network to talk about it and bring it out. Don't internalize uh, whatever is the negative uh, many a times. Uh, and uh, yeah, things will happen. I think if you are at it, things will happen. Very good advice. And I see Preeti. Just two quick things. Um, never think of a rejection as personal. It's the, you know, the recruiters or the people who are hiring you don't really know you. So it's not personal. It's often how you've put your CV or how you, you know, you get to work about, um, see what you, what went wrong. So that was one thing because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've gone through this phase and it takes, you know, in, in the beginning, it takes a month for you to get up and apply a second time, but then it becomes faster. And also realizing that you don't need 25 job applications to work. You need just one of what you like to work. So, I mean, uh, in, I mean, we are geared towards success in academia. We want our publications done and we take pride in ourselves, but kind of just realizing that this is how it is and and find a mentor, maybe somebody in, you know, the in your field or even in industry who can help you look at the CV or say, hey, this is right, this is not right. You should have done this. Um, and believe me, people are willing to mentor. So it's not uh, it's not something that's very, very difficult. Yeah, and I'm going to put a short plug. We've got three prizes at the end of today, so don't go away because people will be reviewing your CVs. Uh, and I see Seski. Yeah, I, I, look, I 100% I agree with what um, Freddie and Louis said. Um, actually, I, I, I wanted to touch on the second piece on the stability of the industries, but um, kind of what you said uh, last there is, I think actually looking back, at least from my perspective, Come, having done science, one of the things that I got used to was failure because of the number of failure experiments I did. Like it was unreal, right? And I think we've all been there. Uh, and so you might be a little surprised of, of how well you are prepared to, to handle that, just, just a parenthesis there. Uh, but, or rejections of manuscripts and many other little steps in science. But anyway, uh, on the stability of, of, of the industries, actually, this is an interesting one. Um, and I would love to maybe hear from the panelists on this, but Coming out of grad school, I had this perception as well that academia was more stable than industry. And you hear all the stories of, you know, all of a sudden this entire branch of a company got shut down and, you know, 100 people got let go. And, the, you know, the, the, that would have happened. What I think I was in purview at that time was there's two pieces to that that were not that, that I appreciate. One is when companies reshuffle or, or reorg, um, you know, a lot of times people will either move within the organization to a different role or move to somewhere similar in a different company because our industry is so big and it's growing, it's very active, the opportunities that are there are actually quite vast and robust, right? And so those transition times can be very short. It's not like you're gonna be uh, looking for a job for you know for a whole year unless probably you, that's what you want, you want to take a break, right? So, um, and, and also in the biotech world, um, I've had a number of friends and I mean, I'm sure Luke can probably speak to this as well. Um, once you're that ecosystem of the startups, right? Some are successful, some, some you know, might uh, end up closing before they expect it. But once you're that ecosystem, you can move a lot more between different companies because there are a lot, of, a lot of opportunities. In the Boston area, in the Bay Area, so many companies are coming up. There's always a business. So once you're in the door, you have that industry experience, you have something to show for, you're going to be a lot more marketable. You can move a lot, a lot more. So, um, you know, I think the question of stability becomes a little bit different one, right? You, you have to be open to changing your title, change your company, but you will find a job and where to land shortly after that. Sounds good. Oh, and I see Rich has his hand up. Yep. Yeah, no, just to, just to sort of piggyback on that, you know, I think sometimes people think of it as, you know, stability versus instability. And I think what you can kind of get from, from Seski and even hearing from, you know, Louie and all of our backgrounds, it's more about stability versus mobility or stability versus opportunity, right? Because it's not necessarily that, you know, they're, they're mutually exclusive of each other, that if you're not, if, you know, that the, the instability actually could be thought of in, in, in different ways, um, depending on how you're open to it. 
And one question I'm going to move us towards because I see it in both areas and, it, and it's a, an interesting question. The person has a couple more years to finish their PhD and they'd like to pursue media and advocate science on a platform similar to Bill Nye or Neil deGasse Tyson or Richard Dawkins. So does anybody have any advice on how uh, scientists might kind of move into the spotlight in that way? Yes, Leo. I think it's hilarious because I think we all want to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. I want to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, you run the Hayden Planetarium. You're the guy who like killed Pluto as a planet. Like this, this he's amazing. Um, but it's interesting. And I've noticed this in some of the applicants that we've been screening currently for our program is that the internet is an incredible wealth of possibilities. So we get folks who, yeah, I, they, I just did my PhD, but I also had a blog where I was writing about um, scientific things of interest to me. Um, more recently during the pandemic, there was a young woman, a scientist who put together, she had her own TikTok channel and she was basically putting together raps about COVID, trying to explain the vaccine or explain the biology of the molecule. And she got a lot of traction um, because she put together this information in a catchy way. So if being in front of a camera and media is something that you're interested in, or if you're interested in media more from the written perspective, start a blog. You can do it for free, um, write about the things that interest you. And it just becomes another thing that when you're putting your resume out there, oh, here's the link to my blog. People, recruiters, will go and look, click on that link and see what you've written. Um, and I've had folks who um, had, were you know not originally from the US. I just had someone um, who is Italian who had a COVID-19 blog that she was writing in Italian. Well, now we have Google Translate. So I could click on her link, press the translate button and read what she wrote. So you, you know, take advantage of all of the really cool tools that you now have at your disposal. Start a YouTube channel, get a TikTok, um, start a blog. Uh, don't feel like you have to be limited to traditional ways of communication because we're not in a traditional world anymore. It's constantly changing and expanding. And if you can show that you understand um, the ways that the world is expanding and changing and that you know how to take advantage of it, you're already 10 steps ahead of the game. So if you want to be the next Neil deGrasse Tyson, I, I'm sure there are, there's a planet you could kill just like he did um, and make a name for yourself. Uh, Thank you. Uh -huh. can, can I jump aside? Uh, yep, go for it. But uh, <laughs> I love that, by the way, Leo. Um, I don't know if I want to be put a, 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 as the response for killing more planets, unpopular opinion. But uh, so, so two, two things I, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, another piece that I want to make a plug, because I guess that's how I, I, I got into DC, is there's a number of um, uh, fellowships and internships that either professional societies or organizations will have to bring in uh, recent grads, especially in science. So like, um, I know actually someone from U of R, uh, a friend and old graduate, uh, Maddie Safaya went to NPR um, and this was via through uh, like a, it was a very short stand that she was brought on board that NPR had for PhDs and that kind of opened the door, led her to have the first foot in the door to then uh, work there for a number of years since she started a podcast, um, Shortwave uh right and so it's kind of that step into the science communication that has many avenues as as we we've, we've seen here right and so fellowships and internships are also like a good in between uh just to get your foot in the door and then take it from there absolutely and as a side note i know that connection happened starting with an informational interview That's so right. if you're yes it so it was it was formal later but the beginning was an informational interview so she was not afraid to connect with these folks so that was one way um bringing it down a little bit from the this the spotlight um what if people just want a typical entry job in in this person is saying pharma perhaps the fda but i think i'll broaden it how do people, if they're they're going from uh, academia into their first entry level job, and as people have noted, maybe it's not your dream job, but it's just a way to get started. What do you suggest that people do in order to get that first entry level job? I'll keep mine short, network. 
spend network. most of your time networking. That's where I, the biggest lift, the biggest uh, time demand was just networking with everyone within a company, around it, and an industry, and then applying for the jobs that I was interested in. And as people are thinking, um, some folks are asking about informational interviews. How do you do such a thing? That's kind of my passion project, I guess. So the idea, uh, if you need help, uh, I'll, I'll send out an email with my, my name in it. But the idea is I will help anybody that wants to do an informational interview. I'm a self-proclaimed introvert. And when I've, been, I've had to do these reportings and reach out to many scientists, it was difficult for me. But if I can do it, I can help you do it. So if anybody wants to learn how to do informational interviews, I will offer that to, to anyone that contacts me. And we are now at nine o'clock. So uh, I, as I said, I'm gonna hand out prizes, but before I let everybody go, I'm gonna let each person address this idea of um, if, you, if you could go back to your younger self and uh, would give the advice to yourself of what one piece of advice would you tell yourself that you're also suggesting to the folks listening in here. And I will start just because uh, Suski is at the top of my uh, screen. What would be the piece of advice you give to yourself that other folks could use here? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, I, I think the, a, a common thing that I've seen in different steps is, I would just say you are ready. And what I mean by that is I think coming out of grass, going to a postdoc, there was a lot of hesitation as to whether or not I was ready for that next career, that next job, that bigger responsibility or new area. And what I have discovered as I've moved on is that I have been, and I've been able to deliver effectively and properly. And so is that self-doubt. So my advice to myself be, you are ready, you know, trust in yourself. And I hope that you guys can, can at least um, continue looking through your paths. Perfect. And then Louis? Yeah, so, you know, one of the key lessons that I learned, and this might tie back to what many people are asking about, should I do a PhD? Should I do this? Should I be that? You know, when I came out of my uh, postdoc, I had, uh, I felt that I'm at the top of the world, right? So <laughs> uh, I had uh, too much confidence in myself. I landed a job, uh, you know, uh, and then quickly I realized that, you know, uh, I think many of the panelists talked about it, that, you know, having a great PhD or having a great publication uh, is, it doesn't set you. Uh, and what I found was that many of my mentors, my colleagues, uh, my boss was a non-PhD. He was a master's and, you know, and quickly I realized and I institutionalized this in many of uh, my places where, you know, for a promotion, you don't have to have PhD. Uh, I had this uh, big ba battle between the management where many of my staff uh, were highly qualified to do their job, but they were not getting promoted purely because they didn't have a PhD. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is something that I learned. And if I go back to my, my younger self, I would, uh, I would tell my younger self, you know, postdocs or PhDs and big papers are overrated. Don't, uh, don't try to, uh, you know, uh, See people through the vision of that. You know, there are people who will, who are highly qualified just by going through the process. Many a times, the, the, the life can be uh, the greatest of your educator, and you could learn a lot of things. And it's not a fancy degree that uh, lets you uh, lets you into the door. Many a times, and uh, I have seen that. As I told you, my one of my mentor and a boss of mine is a non PhD, but amazing sets of knowledge, uh, took several molecules for approval, build franchises, things like that. So, you know, I, I think that uh, that's what I would tell uh, my, my younger self. Yeah, get that experience, get those uh, life experiences. Um, how about Rich? Yeah, I would, I would tell myself to, to not put too much pressure on myself. Um, I think, you know, we, we, it's a lot of pressure in, in the PhD track and, you know, you're all high achievers because you're, you're, you're at this point. So, um, I, I would, I would say, don't, don't do that. Relax a little bit and, and, and stay, stay positive. 
that would be that would be it for me. Sounds good. And Leo, what would your advice be? Yeah, I think along that, like not pressuring yourself track, um, it's not either or, it's not binary. Um, there are, you actually have multiple options open to you. And if you go down one path, it doesn't mean that you close the door permanently to something else. I think people agonize about making a choice because, well, then I could never do so-and-so again. That's not true. Um, so it's more about finding out what's the most appropriate thing for you now and um, give yourself grace that, you know, five years from now, that might not still be the same choice and that's okay too. I think that's a good thing to sum up that that is okay. What you are doing is all okay. Don't be so hard on yourself. And it's not, it's not the end. Once you go through the door, it does not close behind you. Uh, and we have, how about Preeti? What advice would you give to yourself? So, I mean, this is, this is something that um, is very dear to my heart and I would like to just put it in is um, you need to be prepared, but never make a decision hastily. So not because you're frustrated um, with one particular experiment not working because sometimes, you know, I've, and I've done that. I've applied for like hundreds of jobs just because, you know, that particular day was bad. And I'm, um, I'm glad we didn't get it because you have to look at your job as something that you want to get up every morning and be excited about. So um, map your trajectory, see how you know, where you want to go and take time, give yourself some slack. It's okay to take a couple of years to get where you are you know, going to be happy for the rest of your 15, 20 years. So um, that's kind of important. <laughs> Very important. It's, it's good to be happy in your job. And I think something that uh, I think it was Leo said at the very beginning of you, this was not what you wanted. And so you gave yourself the freedom to look for a position that aligned with your values and what you wanted to participate in. It's nice that you're excellent at your jobs, as a lot of PhD and postdocs are at the, at the bench, that you are excellent at what you do. But sometimes you do need to take a little time to think about what is it that you want and what are you interested in? And you will have to dabble a little bit because how can you say, oh, I'm interested in regulatory science if you've never done such a thing? So the idea of give yourself permission to kind of explore, work on yourself a little bit as a project. You do projects in the, in the science realm, you should start thinking about yourself as a project in the personal realm. And so with that, I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us. And audience, please don't go away. Uh, so thanks to the panelists for joining us. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Riti and Smita for gathering the panelists. They put a lot of effort into this. And then Kim Olson and Selena Flores for all the technical expertise that they've been supporting uh, the group with. And I would say with that, uh, I would say thank you for everything that you've done for us and have a good morning. And if you'd like, I'm going to start reading names to see who are the folks that have won the prizes of CV review and also an hour of mentorship. So audience members, if you are out there, get your chat box ready. I don't know if you can do it by phone. So if you're on a phone, you may want to go to a computer. So I'm going to read off the first, I uh, had a random number generator do this. The first person who wins a prize.